me go ahead and read you a little bit about um, Dr. Cynthia Lee. Cynthia Lee is a Bay Area clinician. Clinic <laughs> Cynthia Lee is a Bay Area clinician who practices internal and functional medicine. Dr. Lee did her medical training at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Her practice centered around public and environmental health with a focus on un underserved communities. She worked in the HIV AIDS division of Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco, volunteered with Doctors Without Borders in rural China at the first dedicated HIV AIDS clinic there, and worked as a general internist and taught UCSF medical residents at San Francisco General Hospital and at the St. Anthony Free Medical Clinic in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. She has practiced functional medicine since 2012 and is a member of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the Institute for Functional Medicine. Dr. Lee is currently working on her first book, a memoir about her journey as a patient which changed her practice of medicine. So please welcome Dr. Lee. First of all, thank you for having me here and thank you Palmer for that enlightening um, talk. Nothing about my case or diagnosis or journey is as clear cut as Palmer's. So I'm going to invite you to explore the gray areas of both medicine and patienthood with me. Now, I want you to imagine that you're a patient and you're going to see your doctor because you have a, you have a, a list of symptoms that are vague, but they're real. Could be fatigue, could be dizziness. Um, and your doctor examines you. She runs a, some tests and everything turns out fine. You feel relieved and you go about your life. The only problem is that your symptoms don't improve. In fact, they start to escalate. So you go back to your doctor and you give her your list of symptoms again. And each time you go back, she continues to give you the same answer. Everything's fine. Now you might at this point start feeling frustrated. You're probably feeling dismissed. And at the core of it, you're really feeling frightened. Now I'd like for you to hop over to the other side of the bedside and imagine that you're this patient's doctor. So you've been through grueling training. You've trained to be an expert in chronic conditions, conditions that are defined by a set of criteria. And these criteria are rooted in years of scientific research. They're rooted in years of clinical experience. So when there's no diagnosis, there's no treatment. You know this patient really well. You believe her. <coughs> And as she continues to come back, you are starting to feel frustrated. You're starting to feel dismissed as her doctor. And you become more resolute in your belief in uh, the objective data. So you begin to imagine, is she depressed? And if, if she's not depressed, then I don't have the tools to go forward. I don't really know what to do. Now, in Medical circles, we would call this a difficult patient encounter. I mean, that's a, that's a bona fide phrase. So a lot of tension builds in these, and a lot of doctor-patient relationships become fractured at this point. Now I want you to imagine that you are simultaneously this patient who has symptoms that you feel are real and a doctor who firmly believes the objective data say you're fine. Simultaneously. So that was me. And um, I was two people in one body with belief systems that clashed. So this led not only to a health crisis, but also an existential one. That is, if you believe that those two can be distinguished. 
my illness journey began when I was 34. I was at uh, a very high point in my life. A few years out of residency, I had moved to San Francisco, met the love of my life, got married, we traveled the world for six months with no itinerary. I mean, I was free as a bird. And when we came back, I had uh, my first child. So I was a new mother. I was in a job that was incredibly fulfilling, working with the underserved. So for the rest of my talk, I'm actually going to present myself as a patient case, because that's the way that I can most easily conceptualize complex ideas. So I presented to my doctor four months postpartum after my first child. And I had palpitations, weight loss, heat intolerance, and fatigue. My past medical history was unremarkable. My social history was unremarkable. And my family history was generally unremarkable. There were some metabolic imbalances, but nothing really severe. My labs and my imaging study diagnosed me with postpartum thyroiditis. And um, for those of you who understand more of the pathophysiology, this is similar to Hashimoto's, but occurs after a woman has a baby. So for a few months, I was hyperthyroid, overactive, right? I was hot, I was irritable, I was jittery. And then I fell into hypothyroidism for about six months after that. I was cold and lethargic and depressed. And by the end of a year, this is 2006, my thyroid levels normalized and um, I would tapered off my Synthroid. By all uh, practical definitions, I had resolved my thyroiditis, which is what happens in most cases of postpartum. So at that point, if you had asked me what caused my autoimmune thyroid condition, I would have said two simple answers, genetics and postpartum hormones. Genetics account for about 70 to 80% of the development of postpartum thyroiditis. And the surge of uh, pregnancy hormones and postpartum can be a trigger for the immune system. But the story, of course, continued. And for the next year, I had these persistent symptoms that just wouldn't go away. I presented again, first to my primary care doctor, then to my endocrinologist. And persistent fatigue, dizziness, insomnia, palpitations. You know, I'm sure this has happened to a lot of you. I, I heard that I was a mother. I should, of course, I was tired. I was working. And, um, but I knew something wasn't right. My physical exam was unremarkable. And all my labs were, quote, within the reference range, normal. And of note, my TSH, which is the thyroid screening test, was normal as well. Medically speaking, you are showing signs of recovery. Existentially speaking, you are actively dying. <laughs> so <laughs> this was my dilemma. I continued to, to do what a doctor patient would do. I kept going back to the top experts for answers. I, I had a trusted primary care doctor who repeatedly told me my tests were normal. I went to my endocrinologist who said, your thyroid, it looks fine, it's not your thyroid. And then on the last stop of the merry-go-round, I actually referred myself to a psychiatrist. At this point, I wanted any diagnosis. I just wanted something to hang my hat on, something to treat. And she said, I'm sorry, you're not depressed, you're not anxious, and I bet you anything, it's your thyroid. <laughs> she wanted to send me back to the endocrinologist. And I, you know, and I was very humbled by this experience. I had sent many of my own patients on this referral merry-go-round. And I got off and realized I was kind of on my own. So a question that I ask my patients now is, was there ever a point at which you were never the same? And this is a really important question, similar to Palmer's key question. This was a key question for me. And even though I never felt the same after the postpartum thyroiditis, I was still functional. I was traveling. I was working. I was living a full life. I just didn't feel well. But April 2007, things changed, and I became very debilitated. So when we actually look at these pivotal moments, it's very important. Um, it's like detective work. It helps give us, give us clues as to what might have been the causative agents. What happened in April 2007 is my husband, my daughter, and I took a trip to Beijing to visit my family. And during that trip, now in hindsight, I can put these things together. But at the time, I was just 
living my life and it felt very chaotic. First, I developed um, a very severe gastroenteritis. My husband and daughter got it too. So I assumed it was probably rotavirus. It resolved uh, almost as quickly as it came on. At the same time, I learned that I was in the early weeks of my second pregnancy. So again, huge hormonal shifts. And the third part of the perfect storm was very likely the massive dose of pollut uh, exposure to pollutants as well as foreign food antigens. So what happened was I came back from that trip completely debilitated and as I said, I was in the early weeks of my second pregnancy. So the first six months I was bed bound. Um, by the third trimester, I think the hormones, I got a little bit more energy, but I was largely housebound. And I was housebound largely for the next two years. And what happened after um, my baby, my second child is really, I call her my miracle baby. Um, both she and I survived the pregnancy. I had a very healthy labor and delivery. And she's a very vibrant nine-year-old now. She... Uh, yeah, she kind of carried me through that very difficult period. But after I delivered her, I again got the postpartum thyroiditis. This time it was very severe, very severe hyperthyroid, very severe hypothyroid. And then I, it didn't resolve. So I theoretically graduated from postpartum to Hashimoto's chronic hypothyroidism. And I list the other diagnoses and question marks because I stopped going to see the doctor before I actually got these diagnoses. I knew that, um, that, first of all, I wouldn't be able to tolerate the treat, the, just the evaluation. I was so brittle at that point. And second of all, that I wouldn't be able to tolerate the treatments. So the symptoms I were experiencing were very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome. I felt like I had a chronic flu. I couldn't get out of bed. Uh, my muscles ached. And uh, I had dysautonomia, which is basically a very, very erratic autonomic nervous system. So I could be sitting there and suddenly my heart rate would shoot up to 200. And POTS, postural orthostatic, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a type of dysautonomia where you, you get either pre-fainting spells or fainting spells. And this happened completely at random in fibromyalgia, just feeling like your whole body is kind of on fire. So I was in that state for about two years, largely uh, because of two reasons. One, I had two young kids to take care of, and I was just barely coping day to day. But the other was that I hadn't, it took about two years for me to actually break out of my very, very rigid belief system. I mean, that's how much I believed in the paradigm I was trained in. So at some point, you know, when you break down, you actually break open. And at that point, I began my healing journey. I sought out acupuncture, mostly because I knew this, the studies showed very low risk profiles, and also I felt like it was something my body could actually handle. So I was in San Francisco at the time, got top recommendations, but had to find five practitioners before I found one that my body responded to. And it was he who, he treated me once a week, and that's all I did. In between, I cooked herbs. And uh, he also taught me about how different body systems work together in dynamic function. And the, he also taught me about the importance of gut health and how really the foundation of overall health is the health of our gut. So this is the beginning of uh, a new paradigm for me. He got me to where I could, the dizziness was uh, tolerable. I could read for two or three hours at a time. So I began really doing research in earnest. And uh, the first part I looked was environmental health. And this is where I learned about the exposome. The exposome being the cumulative load of exposures um, over a lifetime. It can start even in the womb. So radiation, drugs, stress, diet, pollution, exercise or lack thereof, infections and how our bodies are not closed systems. In, in medical training, we're just strangely taught that our bodies are closed. You know, we're kind of autonomous. And this kind of blew me into a new, uh, new way of looking at my body, is that I'm constantly putting stuff out, I'm constantly taking stuff in. I'm an ecosystem that's within an ecosystem, and I have an ecosystem within me. So um, I began getting very excited about this new journey. In summary, environmental health can, be, some, can uh, be paraphrased in this sentence. We are what we eat, drink, breathe, touch, think, 
and what our bodies can't eliminate. So the next chapter I investigated was ancestral health. I thought, OK, um, the environmental health was great. It, it taught me sort of what to reduce. What, 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 I, what do I need to get rid of? But it also, um, when you're that brittle and vulnerable, then you start thinking the world feels very bad. Everything is a potential trigger. And so I began um, looking into ways that I could build resilience in my body. And that was ancestral health. So some of you may be familiar with the, the work of Dr. Weston A. Price, the dentist who went around and basically um, provided a lot of concrete data and photographs of how nutrition correlates with good health and bad nutrition correlates with bad health, chronic diseases. And then evolutionary biologists coined the phrase mismatch diseases to mean basically chronic conditions are a result of mismatch between how our genes evolved and our modern environment. And so again, I began thinking lifestyle, lifestyle. We got to really continue to, mo um, to moderate that. At a point when I was, uh, I was able to sort of get out of the house for three or four hours a day. This was, uh, again, over the period of two or three years. I also became weary of trying to piecemeal all of this together myself. It was, felt overwhelming. And I decided, OK, I'd like to try to find an integrative practitioner, both to help me heal faster, but also for me to learn uh, when and if I were able to go back to work. And this blew me, again, into a completely new way of looking at things, but I was overwhelmed. When I began looking, I sent out queries to local practitioners asking if I could shadow them. I wanted to learn what the different modalities were. And uh, I shadowed anyone from anthroposophical medicine all the way to anti-aging hormone medicine. And I felt more lost than when I began my journey. So the very last doctor I shadowed was Dr. Julia Getzelman in San Francisco. She's an integrative pediatrician. And by the end of that morning, she said, what is it exactly that you're looking for? I said, I, I don't know. That's why I'm here. I said, well, I'm I love the paradigm of Chinese medicine you know, where the different body systems are really evaluated in, in uh, dynamic fashion, but as one whole system. Uh, I love the foundation of the gut being the foundation of health. I love ancestral health and nutrient-dense foods, bone broth, nutrient-dense diets. I love uh, environmental health. All that makes sense. And so she looked at me and said, well, you sound like you're interested in functional medicine. And I said, what's that? Never heard of it. So in a nutshell, functional medicine is a science-based, personalized healthcare approach dedicated to prevention, early assessment, and improved management of complex chronic disease. And how does it do that? Basically, um, this is the functional medicine tree. And uh, I'll just help you guys. Uh, you can't read everything. But basically up here, this is how I was trained as an internist to really evaluate patients and their diseases dividing it up, right, my thyroiditis would have fallen right here into endocrinology. And there are various specialists depending on which organ system is affected. Now, where I was with my symptoms was I was down here. I, there wasn't actually a clear diagnosis yet. But when you go below that, you go to signs and symptoms. And you can have signs and symptoms, the research shows, for years before a clinical diagnosis can be made. So what functional medicine does is actually it says, OK, so what about this and so what about this? Let's go down even further to core clinical imbalances. And I highlighted here assimilation because digestion, the uh, gut of the health, is also the foundation for this particular paradigm of healing. The other reason this tree felt very, um, very helpful to me as a concept was that down here, now I've expanded those over here so you can read them better, but these are the environmental inputs. That, that we all know, right? Sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress, relationships, trauma, infections, pollutants. But really what they're showing is that these things directly feed in and they will contribute to core clinical imbalances. And so as a, as a doctor thinking more in terms of scientific and physiological concepts, this was a really useful tool for me. So instead of... Uh, Oops. Instead of uh, ruling out and reducing 
the, di the diagnoses, really we're switching over to looking at establishing mechanisms and causes and really trying to find out what the patterns and the connections are. Um, rather than eliminating confounding variables, we're trying to include all variables. Testing to confirm diagnosis, to uh, testing and confirming causes and mechanisms. And rather than symptom management or disease suppression, really looking to eliminate the causes and to restore optimal function. So at this point, if someone had asked me what caused my thyroiditis and my severe fatigue and what is perpetuating it, I wish I had two or three simple word answers to say that's what it is. But the answer looks more like this, all right? Life caused it. So this is the functional medicine timeline, and I'll just orient you, oops, I'll orient, orient you briefly. Um, over here are antecedents. These are basically uh, factors that will predispose you to a particular disease. Uh, mediators and perpetuators, uh, factors that will continue to pr uh, promote the inflammation and the disease or the symptoms. And then triggers and triggering events. And then down here are really just the signs and symptoms of the, of the diseases. So, and then right here is time zero or birth. So basically my antecedents I was looking at, okay, my genes, right? I said in the initial presentation that I didn't have any family history really of autoimmunity. Well, since the time I was diagnosed with thyroiditis, my sister has been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, my brother has been diagnosed with Graves, my father has been diagnosed with subclinical hypothyroidism. So it's definitely in my family and I had warned them, you guys, we have this uh, gene and it's in our family history, we have to really start paying attention to our environment. Um, the other uh, factor, of course, is just being born of a woman. Um, increases my risk of uh, thyroiditis, uh, the, the increased risk is four to five to one, all right? And then the concept of epigenetics, turning your genes on and off, and there are some preliminary studies suggesting that epigenetic changes can be passed on through generations. And so while it's not uh, concrete information, it made me wonder, okay, you know, in my, in my parents' generation, in, in my grandparents' generation, there was war, there was malnutrition, there was immigration. Did I get, receive some of those epigenetic changes? So I was born a uh, normal standard vaginal delivery, a uh, healthy baby. I was fed formula, uh, exposed to chronic secondhand smoke in the house for the first year of my life. And what happened was I got a lot of ear infections. So what did I get? Antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. So I'm just trying to paint the picture of, okay, if our gut is really the foundation of health, particularly in the early years of our life, you know, these factors matter. Um, I was also a very sensitive child. So uh, I do, became hypervigilant. Um, sensitive children, there's some studies suggesting that they develop uh, under chronic stress, more maladaptive stress responses that later in life lead to increased risk for disease. Um, but you know, I was otherwise a pretty normal kid. I got my period when I was 12, normal. Um, but I, my periods were irregular. They were 21 days, always, instead of 28. So is that a sign of hormonal imbalance? So, and I just wanna um, point out that this is all in hindsight. Um, in hindsight, sometimes we can also ascribe meaning that isn't really there. But it's interesting to put all these things together and try to come up with a story. Um, I became, uh, I got motion sickness. My family traveled a lot, but nobody else in my family did, and I got it pretty severely. Uh, I also got bronchitis a lot. So <coughs> is the motion sickness, the bronchitis, signs of immune suppression or you know, neurological imbalances? Well, what I got for the bronchitis, again, were many more uh, bouts of antibiotics. Um, in my middle school teenage years, I switched from the traditional Chinese diet in our house to the standard American diet. Lots of candy and lots of fast food. But again, normal adolescence. Um, then I began my medical training in my 20s. Massive exposure to chronic uh, chemicals, formaldehyde in the, in the anatomy lab. The hospital is one of the, the least healthy places to be. Um, I also had a long-term relationship during my medical training that ended by way of a fatal car accident. So that was tremendous grief, 
that was not expressed, I was in training. I had about a week off uh, after he died. My periods became more irregular, so what did I do? I started on birth control pills. The, the, you know, the, uh, the on-call schedule really disrupted my circadian rhythm. So my symptoms at that time, of course I was fatigued. Everybody around me was fatigued. But I did actually develop insomnia. Despite the fatigue, I could not sleep. So the other thing I had was that post-call, you know, we do these crazy 36-hour calls. I, my muscles were really sore. I mean, sore like I felt like I'd run a marathon. I also became dizzy post-call. Um, that's what this is. But I, did, I just assumed everybody was like that. Of course everybody feels lousy. They, you know, we just worked ourselves to death. Um, and then in my second year of residency, I developed acute mono. And this comes in later with chronic fatigue as well. So, uh, but again, I was very functional, and I was very happy for the most part. I finished my residency, moved out to San Francisco, got married. This is the round the world trip my husband and I took. But again, more antibiotics, <laughs> prophylaxis for malaria, whatnot. Um, my first pregnancy <coughs> was, uh, I mean, by all standards, very healthy. I walked to work every day until I delivered. But in hindsight now, I know I had, uh, I developed SVT, um, a tachycardia that's very common in young women in my third trimester. And it was picked up by a Holter monitor. But um, I also developed really, really severe, severe bilateral, bilateral tendonitis. And everyone kept saying, oh, it's, you're, just, you're just pregnant, you're pregnant. And in hindsight, was this my thyroid starting to kick off? I don't know. Um, my daughter was born very healthy, but during the delivery, I spiked a fever and I got IV antibiotics. <laughs> So there's a, there's a real pattern here going on. Um, of course, and as I mentioned, I was diagnosed with a thyroiditis uh, four months later. What was interesting and unusual about my diagnosis was that my endocrinologist recommended I have a radioactive iodine scan, which is usually not done, particularly to a mother who's nursing. Usually it's either you watch and wait or you do a thyroid ultrasound. But the, uh, the radioactive iodine itself is a potential trigger for thyroiditis. Um, so on top of new, you know, motherhood, chronic illness, house renovations, right, uh, relationship stress. And then uh, came the trip to Beijing, pollution, second pregnancy, and the gastroenteritis. So this is kind of where I ended up 2008 in the state of debilitation. So. When I found functional medicine, I thought, oh my god, you know, I'm in the promised land. I'm not invisible anymore. I've got lots of things to do. And then I felt, oh my god, I suddenly felt naked. I felt too visible. There were suddenly all these other root causes and root imbalances that could contribute to what it was that I had. I didn't even know where to start. I got completely overwhelmed. So then I decided, OK, and not only that, I didn't even believe that some of these things existed. So I reduced it down again to simple concepts I could grasp. The autoimmune triad, environment, genes, immune dysfunction, which I basically correlate with gut uh, dysfunction and permeability. So I was really focusing again more on the environment, cleaning it up, and immune dysfunction, giving my immune system nutrients that it needed to function properly, and uh, healing my gut. So, but if I wanted to reduce it down further, to uh, to two questions, what did my body need to restore and what did it need to remove? And if I distilled it down to yet one question, what was driving my chronic inflammation? That's the common root of all, all my symptoms and also all my diagnoses. So my healing journey looks like this. And um, again, the, the, antece uh, the antecedents over here um, these are just all lumped together, the perpetuators of healing, and these are kind of my symptoms. So when you have a chronic illness for a long time, particularly one that's ill-described and one that no one knows how to even touch, you, uh, you know, when you look at that, that illness journey, it just looks like, I mean, you're just, you're hosed, you're doomed. There's no way you're going to be able to remove all of those factors or, or correct them. And, uh, but, I, but then I started thinking, well, my God, what, I mean, it's a miracle I'm not dead. I mean, that, that the human race is not dead, 
right? I mean, given all the stuff that we're exposed and we do to ourselves, we're still, um, we're still fighting. So there's a resilience built in. And I began to look at my antecedents more for resilience than for uh, factors that, that were dooming me. I began to look at my parents. Okay, you know, yeah, they have some diabetes and high blood pressure and some subclinical hypothyroidism, but you know what? They're well. They're very alive, well. Um, they travel all the time in their 70s. My four grandparents, they lived very long lives. They, uh, and, and, gener and generally didn't become sick until the very end. And so I thought, okay, I've got some resilience in there. And as far as being female, I mean, women, if you look at it, right, we tend to live longer. We tend, and the studies show that we tend to manage stress better. We have, our stress responses are more resilient. And, um, and we're also better multitaskers. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna use those to my advantage. So um, this is 2010 and this is current. So we talked about the acupuncture and the nutrient dense foods, uh, the, the ancestral health foods and really the gut healing. What I was really focusing on was the fermented foods, probiotics, bone broth, L-glutamine, digestive enzymes. Um, what I noticed uh, after a withdrawal reaction after that was that my skin cleared. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of symptoms that I didn't even mention, but I had uh, broken out. I also had rashes of eczema. Those had cleared up. Uh, and my energy was increased just a notch. Uh, then I, I looked further and uh, got tested. I saw the connection between celiac disease and Hashimoto's and decided to get tested for that. And what was interesting was in my research, I also came across, right, I talked about the gastroenteritis in Beijing, probably rotavirus, but there's also um, evidence of rotavirus increasing the risk of celiac disease. And not just by gut inflammation, um, but also by mo molecular mimicry. There are uh, gene sequences in there that, that are very similar. So sure enough, I was positive. So I eliminated gluten, I eliminated dairy, I also eliminated soy, and this was a, just kind of a, um, more of a comprehensive elimination diet. Um, around that same time, I also began looking into ways to uh, change my, my neural pathways because, right, our, our head is connected to our body. So, um, the neural pathways are connected to the hormone pathways, they're connected to the immune pathways. And so I thought, my God, if I can really begin to change my thoughts, change my, uh, calm the entire stress system down, then uh, I could really uh, heal from that. And to this day, I do Qigong every day. So after that, I, uh, I had symptoms that I didn't even know were symptoms. I was getting up and urinating two or three times a night. And, uh, I thought it was just due to pregnancy and childbirth. But as soon as I started the neuroplasticity uh, exercises, that completely went away. I had, I, earlier I said I have fibromyalgia. I actually didn't even know that at the time. I had these flu-like aches in my shoulders and kind of my whole body was achy. But I didn't even know it. It was so constant and chronic and I had so many other debilitating symptoms. I didn't even know it until they went away. And I thought, oh my god, that was fibromyalgia. This is what people with fibromyalgia have. And then my dizziness and energy improved uh, again. I began looking into detox, right? How do I, okay, my body's taken in a bunch of environmental pollutants. How do I get rid of them? How do I help my body support my liver, support these detox pathways? Protein, uh, really increasing protein in my diet, amino acids, magnesium, uh, antioxidants, methyl B vitamins, turmeric, fiber. And again, this is kind of over a long period of time. I also began to support my hormones um, I had continued my thyroid support. What was interesting about uh, my levothyroxine was I was on a full dose of 100 micrograms a day. And then when I removed the gluten and the dairy, uh, I actually went down to 25 micrograms a day. So it was a clear perpetuator of thyroiditis. Um, and this is my favorite prescription to give myself as well as my patients, is to practice pleasure. Practice pleasure. And I say practice because it was a very intentional thing for me. One thing chronic illness does is it immediately robs you of pleasure and you forget. And so I started going gardening. Um, I tapped back into my community. Uh, this is grief work, right? Really learning how to befriend my grief and just release it and get it out of my body so that it was, you know, my body was freer. And then the last thing uh, that I've done in the last two years is to begin, I started, actually it didn't start out as a memoir project. I just started writing to see whatever would come up as a form of pleasure. And it turned out to be a full-on memoir. And it's been more important than I had realized what 
um, happens also with chronic illness is that you begin to identify. You identify with the illness. The illness is you. In that, in that state, the identification is in and of itself a perpetuator of chronic illness. And so by doing the writing for me, and there's many, many other ways to do it, I got out from under the monster of chronic illness. So where, I'm, where am I today, 46 years old? Um, it's always hard for me to answer this because I feel very different than who I was when I began. I also have a very different lifestyle than when I began. But I would say fatigue, maybe I have 15, 20% more to go. It's hard to say, but I'm also not sort of you know, running marathons and rollerblading and all that. But I also have a full family. I have a very full life, and I'm back to work. Um, dizziness has been the biggest um, area I've recovered. Is uh, I probably have about 10% more to go. And that, that really only presents itself when I'm under stress or if I have a cold. The insomnia is probably my biggest beast uh, still yet to uh, figure out. And if any of you here have any suggestions, I'm very open <laughs> to uh, your suggestions. I have tried a lot of different things. But that said, I've also learned to be in a state of relaxation at night when I'm not sleeping. So how much am I time up? OK, so I won't. Uh, these are the last two slides are really just summary slides of what I went to in depth on the healing journey. Um, and I just wanted to close with a quote by Sir William Osler, who is the father of modern medicine. Medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So be patient with yourselves and be patient with your doctors. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we are now going to take a short break.